We have told you a number of different times, and you have helped make Pablo Torre Finds Out something that in a very crowded field of podcasts is standing out because uh, every episode has a lot of care in it, an unusual amount of care. And so the latest Pablo Torre Finds Out, Stugatz, I think will be particularly interesting to you, as I was saying before, because I don't know how Pablo got this uh, video. I don't know what the story behind it is. He's figuring stuff out, He Dan. is, uh, yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, Pablo, what you've unearthed is the 10 minutes that the Knicks uh, were presenting as video to LeBron James when they had the chance to run the last 15 years in the sport when LeBron ran the sport for 15 years. If, he, if they'd convinced him in these 10 minutes... All of basketball is different the last 15 years. Yes. First of all, first of all, Stu, thank you. I did this for you, Stu Gatz. Well, thank you. I did this for you. Yep. Um, Dan has framed this correctly. There was a crossroads in basketball history when everybody in New York City thought, of course, LeBron James, you guys remember him, mm. I believe. Yep. Of course, LeBron James would come to New York City. New York City has everything. New York City is the greatest city in the world. And the question that James Dolan had to answer was how do you convey this in a room when the door closes and you're sitting there with Mike D'Antoni and Alan Houston and your executives from the Garden and you have a, an allotted time to convince LeBron that New York City is the only place where you could be the best version of yourself. And they made a video that had been long rumored forever. It has been like this mythological artifact <laughs> that people have talked about because there were rumors like they got James Gandolfini Three years after The Sopranos had ended, one of the most controversial, debated endings in television history, they got him to do a special, like, bar mitzvah video, basically, for LeBron James. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, Stugatz, if I told you right now, this isn't just reporting. If I told you right now, would you like to see just that, Stugatz, of The Sopranos is the number one most impeccably made television show and pop culture phenomenon on Earth, Hasn't been seen in three years. Gandolfini is like this mystery shadow figure, super interesting. And they got him on behalf of the Knicks to produce a video that Pablo now has. And where? who are you presenting this video to, Pablo? What's the clip we're throwing to? I'm going to present to you the clip that LeBron James saw himself. No one has ever seen this, okay? Hmm. This is the thing. No one has been able to prove this is real. Just people have talked about it. And so the lights go down. James Dolan is at the table with LeBron James and Maverick Carter and his then agent Leon Rose in Cleveland. Lights go down. And this is the video that begins. Yeah, I'll take it down. Tony, I'm so glad we moved to New York. Life is so much better now. Yeah. Life's well, good here, Carl. <laughs> Even if we are in the witness protection program. <laughs> now we just got to find a place for your friend LeBron to live. What's he like? Well, he's a modern guy, but he respects tradition. Well, here's something classy on the east side. Was well, it big enough? It's going to be entertaining a lot of people in New York. It's very expensive. Oh, that's not going to be a problem. But you got to find something magnificent. Something there's nothing in the world like it, one of a kind, like he is. Well, here's a place. It says it gets really loud there. Take a look. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, that's it. That's going to be perfect for him. Allow me to reintroduce myself. My oh, my God. <laughs> the, 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 Knicks, the Knicks made the Sopranos bad. How did oh they my do that? God. Tony's alive. Tony was alive. The Knicks solved it. They got James Gandolfini, a man who refuses to do anything. He's a recluse, as Dan alluded to, a guy who refused to do anything like this. They got him to do this privately for LeBron. They expected that no one would ever see it. And now that we see it, we have a couple of answers as to, like, what happened at the end of the greatest television show of all time. And also, very crucially, what the fuck are the Knicks doing? <laughs> and why LeBron chose Miami. Well, <laughs> hold on a second, though. This is, I'll just send you over to Pablo Torre Finds Out so that you could get the other nine minutes that were in that video. So because much. this this is a whole <laughs> sales pitch. I don't, where would you rank that that little clip where would you rank it from among the best that you think you have if you had to rank the best of what this had to make fun of the Knicks from every angle on how they were mismanaged 15 years ago what I need to tell you is that um this video in all of its 10 minute long glory does not age well and so that I actually really enjoyed that when I first saw it I really did enjoy it 
where it goes immediately, and I don't want to spoil this because you just got to come watch the video, guys. Support the fact that I'm hustling to get these artifacts for you. Um, it's it, it gets bad immediately, like really bad immediately. <laughs> and the thing about what this video was, as Dan has been sort of framing it, it's how do you convince when you have the privacy, the presumed privacy of this room with the closed door, how do you, as one of the most iconic teams of all time, convince the biggest free agent ever to come play for you? And so it's a window into how James Dolan thinks. Who are the Avengers he summons to come through the portal to convince LeBron James that the Knicks are the place? Not screw Pat Riley. We know what Riley did, right? Pillowcase full of rings. Mm -hmm. We know that story. That's how you get them. This is the alternate history. (laughs) This is what the Knicks (laughs) tried to do. And this is why it very obviously did not work. It's kind of one of the things that's amazing about whatever it is that'll be unearthed in this 10 minute video is it's not just it changed the fate of the sport and and obviously Miami sports over the next 15 years. But uh, the fact that now we can see the videos, Stugatz, that would make us better understand. It's not going to be a complete version of, wait a minute, LeBron to New York was the biggest slam dunk ever. How yes. could he have he not just... He was wearing a Yankees no, hat. How could yes. he have... How, like that LeBron to... How do they botch LeBron to New York? The Knicks were on the doorstep of everyone saw, yeah, the most obvious thing is do what the Knicks are doing now, which is, oh, look, the... We've got the uh, agent crews running our shows here. The Knicks management team, Stugatz, is basically just what LeBron's management team is now running clutch. And Leon Rose, the president of the Knicks, and the Knicks, of course, are really good now, right? Two seed, all of that. The guy who's running the team, Leon Rose, was in the room for this. He was LeBron's agent. He got Mm. to see this. And so it's almost like he got a reverse blueprint for what not to do. And the question for the strategy here was initially, and you're, and, and Stugatz, you're totally right. LeBron wore a Yankee cap to a Cleveland Indians, New York Yankees playoff series. Teased us. He was wearing, he was, he was more than teasing. It he was the to, surest thing. It was the yes. most obvious thing. And we were wondering, how do they botch this? And what you're telling us is you've got 10 minutes of them botching it. What I'm telling you is that go to this video and I will further spoil it because there's even a worse face than the one I'm going to mention. But the first face you see, because I can't help myself, after the Sopranos um, secret ending reveal is Donald Trump. So just know that it gets worse from there. It gets worse from, hey, guy you would feud with famously over racial issues in America, famous black LeBron James, athlete, iconic figure. That guy is the first face that you meet coming out of that in the darkness of a pitch room. And it is bad. Pablo, since you've seen the entire video, how long into the video do you think LeBron told himself, I'm not coming here? (laughs) If I I would like all of us actually, Stu, to answer that question for ourselves. I don't want to lead the witness. Okay. But I'm actually fascinated. Because I, I, we held a focus group in the episode with Jason Exception and uh, Worldwide Wob, Rob Perez, mm-hmm. because I wanted to simulate, okay, here are guys who are not, like, anti-Knicks by nature. They want the best for this team. Right. And when you watch this, pretend this – is, it's a great way of, of, of framing this, too. <laughs> pretend you're LeBron. You're a famous guy with access to everything. Right. And by the way, here's another funny bit about what we just played for you, just that little bit, right? They play Jay-Z public service announcement, that song, as like the outro into what becomes like a segue into this procession of what I call like the basically James Dolan's recruiting hostesses, almost like college football style. You meet everybody in order. They're trying to convince LeBron to come to New York. The song that they play, Jay-Z, that's the guy who quite literally, it's very, it's absurd it happened this way. Jay-Z was pulling out of the parking lot because he was selling LeBron on the nets as the Knicks were coming in. So immediately you're like, okay, I don't think the Knicks necessarily anticipated this correctly because they're selling him on the guy who just pitched him come to Brooklyn. All right. And uh, that's first 
one minute. That's the first minute of the I will thing. send Jesus. people over there. Pablo Torre finds out. He says he is hustling for those artifacts. It's very, uh, very long weeks unearthing, trying to unearth. Everyone's at this trough trying to grab the interesting stuff. And he found uh, a bit of a treasure here that will. This is a great one. Well, I mean, it, it's a treasure for yeah. a number of reasons, especially as the Knicks head into the playoffs now with like real loud yes. hope for the first time in a, a quarter century. But. Um, before we go any further, where would you like to go? Because there's no more time, so you have to pick one of these three topics. You've Ooh. got the WNBA, you've got the playoffs starting, uh, you've got the draft, the playoffs, the NBA playoffs starting, and you've got a United States president uh, facing felony charges, uh, first time ever in a criminal court that's ever happened. Take your shot. What do you want? Weirdly, I think the episode today we've just been discussing actually hits on the last part the president thing so i'm gonna i'm gonna punt on that for the purposes of this yes and just marvel and just marvel truly at like when you say wnba the first thing you think of is wow that ratings monster like we have not seen this dad like i had morgan murphy on my show on friday to talk about what it's like actually when you've been rooting and watching and consuming and trying to evangelize people on your favorite sport she's one of the she's the biggest women's basketball fan i know in my life and She's been trying to convince people for 20 years, this is worth it, and it's finally happening. And there's comedy, right? And not merely you being proven right, but also the dynamic of what happens when everybody starts, like, gentrifying the thing you love. And so I was a bit of this with Lucy and Iowa, but the way it's happening at scale here with Caitlin Clark and women's basketball is funny because you have to handle this unprecedented problem. A deeply unpopular thing seemingly overnight is now popular. And now you are both vindicated and infuriated that everybody has takes delivered with the confidence of people who've been there for as long as you have. <laughs> and that is both a sign that you've made it and is also your personal hell. Like a genie cursed you with a wish that they granted with the footnote of, and by the way, now Stephen A is going to have takes about Caitlin Clark that are going to make you infuriated. Like that's... It's an amazing thing we've just never seen before in American sports. I can't believe the Sparks took Cameron Brink. That is not the play you take at number two. They need offense. They took defense. They went offense. You got to go offense there. You have to go with Cardoso from South Carolina. Exactly. I mean, what are they thinking? <laughs> Could not be more wrong. I'm flipping through the channels the other day, Stu Gatz. I'm not even watching the Marlins game. I'm just flipping through the Marlins game. And I stop and my, I see there's Ron McGill uh, in the stands with a giraffe, a fake giraffe of some sort, and his wife. And, uh, and I was told huh. he, th he threw out the first pitch, evidently, the honorary first pitch. How many of those in your life have you gotten to throw, Ron? Just two, Dan. Just two. This is my second time. But it's the first time in the daytime with the roof open in that, uh, in that ballpark, which was beautiful. Uh, okay. But what an unnecessary fact. Yeah, but how it did, affected his pitch. Yeah, how mm -hmm. did you do both times? Did you, were you, it, uh, is it pressurized? Were you able to get the ball there easily? I got it there. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I, I practiced, you know, they let me practice against the wall there a lot. And I threw probably a hundred pitches just to make sure I could get it across. I didn't want to be embarrassed. Wow. And I will tell you, I woke up the next morning and I'm sore. I'm sore from throwing a baseball a hundred times. <laughs> against the wall? Yeah, against the wall. A hundred? Go they, they, they got a place in the ballpark there where they warm up the people who want to throw a first pitch. And it's literally, you know, it's a big white wall that you throw the ball against so it comes right back to you so they don't have to have someone catching and throwing back to you. And hmm. that's what I was doing. I threw like 100 of them, and I was getting the heat on there. As a matter of fact, I, I threw it so hard that Billy kind of missed it. It bounced off his face. Huh. You, you, hit the mascot, you hit the mascot in the face? I, I, not on purpose. I threw it right at him, but it went by his glove, and it hit him in the face. Did you go from the mound, or...? On the mound, baby. That's that's important. Thanks for the point there, Stu Guy. Yep, you got all it. these other people are stepping up on the grass. Yes. No, I stepped on the rubber from the mound. Yeah, yeah. have to. Yeah. Well done, Ron. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get to our animal questions, Chris Cody, I was shocked to hear this from your father uh, during the break. He was he was yelling at both Slam Magazine and Jimmy Butler, and he's like, "Somebody fears the Heat in a seven game series. That's what you have to say." That is quote, "Heat bull culture bluster." Bull <laughs> that is heat culture talking. No, but that's heat. you called it heat bull culture bluster. I think I'm being slightly misquoted there, but I'm no, not I'm, I'm no. no. 
to know. Paraphrasing. No, they're, 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 I'm quoting you. It, it I wrote it down. Okay, yes. Normally, I don't swear. Heat, bu- culture, bluster, bull. Two okay. bullshits. Yeah. Right. Yes. One of the one of the main platforms of heat culture is overconfidence. I, I, the idea that you would be the team nobody else wants to play. All I'm saying is that very few people in America are going to have a lot of money riding on the heat to beat the Celtics in a seven-game series. That's all. Not to say they can't do it. Not to say they can't replicate last well, postseason. Uh, but, okay. But, but the but odds the, are the, really, the, really the, against the, I understand that they're different teams. They are different teams. But the last <laughs> time those teams played a series, the, the last time it happened, these two teams have been fighting at the top of the conference for right. five straight years. Yep. Tatum, this year, though. Tatum is viewed as an underachiever only because Miami has stood in his way. We should be celebrating Greg Cody today for not being a homer. He's a good point. Seriously, yeah. standing up. Congrats, Greg. Uh, Look, Congratulations, Greg. Okay, I'm proud of you. Hey, I mean, that's just you. Are you sure? Are you feeling okay? Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Take a bow. Yeah. Go. Take a bow. Yeah. You Take are a bow. hero. Take a bow. Right now. Yeah. 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 Do a jig. Yeah. Do a jig. Do the Charleston. Do the Charleston. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want to make clear. Uh, I'm not. I an- want to make clear. I am a homer. Yeah. I'm, I'm all not, right. Yeah. I'm not anti heat. I'm no, not anti heat. No. I'm not wishing they lose. He's pro truth. I'm thinking they're going to lose. That's yeah. all. I think they're going to lose Wednesday night in Philly, right. and I think they're going to lose wow. in the first round. That's I don't know all. About that. uh, so wait, they'll get into the eighth seed. So they'll win so Friday. They'll, they'll win the Friday matchup. I think so. Yeah. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. And 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 then they play Boston, which is very unfortunate. Sweep. It's an interesting series. Anything I mean, can happen in a seven-game series, though. Five. Greg. That's what I keep hearing. Yeah. No one wants to play the Heat. In a not seven in yeah, seven. Apparently series. not. No, oh my God! Five games. Why, why would you want to play a team that's forty-six and thirty-six? I mean, wow. Well, you're forgetting they have Spo, and he can make the adjustments in a seven-game series. That's another yeah. plank. They lost in the more heat games, less season. <laughs> okay. Forty-six yeah. and thirty-six. You mock. Uh, They're but better than last year. The Knicks won fifty games this year, and it's a monumental achievement. It is for them. Yeah. What have they done since Willis Reed? If you extrapolate that 46 and 36 over like a thousand game samples, that's almost 100 games over 500. That's a good point, Billy. Yeah. And you know, just because the Marlins are on pace to go 29 and 133, Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they will. So let's keep that. Make that make that a thousand game samples. The Marlins won 290 games. Uh, Ron, what is the greatest sports honor you have received uh, when you have been at as some sort of local icon? And where does throwing out first pitches rank in terms of local sports honors for you? That's that's the greatest sports honor for me. I mean, other than going, it's not really a sports honor when I was in the Arbiters Hall of Fame. I guess the greatest sport award I got was I was the one on one champion. No, wait a minute. No, wait. Th- this happened. The- this happened already. <laughs> the- <laughs> You're not going to. I do forgot that. the hot dog Hall of <laughs> Fame. I apologize. <laughs> I'm not making fun. What an honor. Now you are. You are. But uh, no, my greatest sports honor, I guess the greatest thing ever as far as playing sports was I was the one-on-one all-campus champion at the University of Florida in the intramural program. Wow. Wow. Uh, Ron, wait a minute. I do want to get stuck here again before we get to the animal video. Why is it, Greg Cody, that I cannot have Ron McGill on, ask him (laughs) on? (laughs) It is ridiculous. It's the the first. It, our betters is a funny word, okay. I'm a word enjoyer, and our betters is funny to me. All right, if I can continue, please. I simply want for everyone to understand that every time Ron McGill talks about a syrup, a syrupy deep honor to him, sincerely, yeah. because he because Ron McGill appreciates what I'm about to say, which is the following. That he's a local icon, and when a place that is a local icon also celebrates you, then he becomes part of the flavor and taste of Miami. Yeah. For, Thank you. For, I, I do agree with that. Oh, okay. Well so, said. So, but in that, that that Greg Cody would continually mock that as one of your greatest honors, uh, and that he laughs every time it's mentioned is to me it feels insulting to your friendship. Look, we no, got, no, you know, no. Greg. Like I said, Greg's not, he's not a homer. So he's just not going to, you know, mm-hmm. agree with everything. I, I, I bow to Greg. I understand, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a world renowned columnist. I don't, I'm just a local zookeeper who sometimes gets a bone thrown to him by the hot dog guy. So well, I'm happy. I mean, you're in the Arbiters Hall of Fame and you always will be. 
Yeah, thank you so very much. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much. Come on. There it is, baby. There it is. Yeah, look at that. Look how happy he was. Of course, why wouldn't he wow. be? And are you wearing the same shirt? Is no, it's a different it's shirt, a Dan. Different I, shirt. It's a okay. different shirt. Okay. That's a big crowd you got there. Uh, and no, it was packed. There was a, there was a live band. Greg. It was, it was no, it real. is. What are you doing? Greg. Oh, a big crowd. It is. It looks like a David Sampson crowd at a vineyard. <laughs> Wow. He's oh, my every- gosh. That no. must have been one hell of a traffic jam, man. You are he said, everybody else. Wait, he said he came in here with road rage, and we haven't addressed it. That I meant to address close. it four segments ago. He's been complaining about Roy. Oh, I, I so regret not telling the audience that he was going to take everyone out today because he did come in here steaming. McGill. Greg yes. Cody, as legendary Miami people, can you please shout to the skies for our leadership, for somebody to help us with the terrible traffic congestion problem that we have because our infrastructure is not built for the number of people who now live in South Florida? You make a good point, Dan. You of all people probably suffering that living on the beach because the beach, oh, Lord have mercy. That is a nightmare. I only go out there to see you. That's it's nice. the worst I've seen lately. It, and it's no, get, it's the and worst it's, it's ever worse. been. It no, is getting we worse. are now old people complaining about traffic. <laughs> old people complaining about local traffic. Damn right. But it can't be this bad anywhere else in the United States. It can't be. It's not possible. Well, I, well, I, 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 I disagree. I, I was just in New York City, but then you don't need a car because you got incredible public transportation. But New right. York City is ridiculous. You can walk faster than you can drive. And, and, and likewise, I, I just spent four days in L.A., uh, in stop and stop traffic on the 405, which is oh, absolutely yeah. horrific. So uh, I'm sure all over the country, people are saying, well, no, we have bad traffic too. But Miami is the worst right now than I've ever experienced. Ron, were 27 people inducted into the Arbiters Hall of Fame this year? Big class. Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, it could have been 27. What, what, what's your point, Billy? <laughs> no, I'm just asking. I'm just curious. That's the entire crowd. Wait a minute. <laughs> 27? <laughs> I, 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 Don't I, let anyone in. Wait man. a minute, Ron. An inductee class of 27? Your point, Dan? <laughs> I mean, there are more people outside of the Hall of Fame than inside it. Wow. Now, why don't you and Cody go out to lunch? Wow! Oh. Go out to lunch at our betters. Yeah, let's go, yeah, to, go our to our betters. Anybody who buys a kraut dog gets inducted into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know that, Ron. Okay, guys. How about those animal videos? All right. Let's let's play this video for Ron. It's an orangutan and a juice box. So tell me, uh, this is going viral on TikTok. It is B-roll. And tell me what's happening here. Narrate this. Christmas. You know, this is, again, people doing things that shouldn't be done just to get clicks. Um, first of all, whatever that orangutan is drinking, you probably shouldn't be drinking. You got a plastic straw, ripping off the plastic, throwing it out, everything bad about plastics, going into more plastic stuff, drinking. You know, stop stop promoting this garbage. It says a stop lot of promoting. vitamin C, though, in the orange juice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I don't even think that's orange juice. I think it's just some artificially sweetened crap, and you, you're giving this orangutan an addiction to sugar, like crack, and it's just the worst thing you could possibly do. And of course, social media, the toilet bowl of the internet, keeps promoting it. Well, I see from the uh, video is a great ape using tools. Yeah. Like, well, is a great that, illustration. That, that, the part that is I that, was. Is that, is that what you saw? Is that what you Spit saw? Out I mean, after? if I'm going to take a positive from the video, that would be it. I saw an orangutan okay. polluting. But, uh, first of all, it's orangutan, not that tang. One, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, he was uh, drinking tang. Uh, yeah, drinking tang. You're in the minority, yeah. Roy, if that's all you saw. He littered. There's no question about it. Okay. Roy's a minority? No, 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 no. I'm taking the positive out of the video, and that's the positive that I saw. And a great ape oh, in uh, a Roy, you know, I will it. say a that you are, a bright, you are a bright spot on this show. You are definitely a bright really? spot on this show. He's Thank never you. been described that way. Ever. Yeah. No, not by you. <laughs> also, Roy is not in the Arbiter's Hall of Fame. Why I can eat a hot dog, though. John Jay is, though. John Jay is what? in? What? So is Coach Mirabal family from Columbus High School. Wow! Who Whoa. accepted on the family's behalf, Ron? Ron is uh, George Moss. George Moss, and he was there. He accepted. Ron, the thing about this video that I did think was more interesting than don't do this to orangutans. They need to have a natural lifestyle that's not sugary, plastic, straws, and cardboard. But 
he unwrapped the straw and used the straw to drink from a juice box. And I do believe that you've become somewhat numb to how amazing animals are if you are not marveling like we are at the orangutan using this as a tool this way, the way a human would, and telling us how smart this animal is. Dan, I've told you over and over how smart these animals are. I've watched an orangutan watch a zookeeper unlock a, a, a lock with a key and then try to take a stick to use it as a key to pick that lock to get out of out of its enclosure. So uh, they are incredibly intelligent. They use all kinds of tools for things. I just wish they would show a tool of maybe an orangutan using a stick to get some honey out of a beehive as opposed to pulling out a plastic straw from a plastic wrapper and putting it into artificial sweetened juice. Don Van Orsdal. Funeral home magnate. Wow. Whoa. Hall of Fame this year. Star like, power. <laughs> DVO. People are dying to get I, in. I, I, our, betters, our betters better give me a ton of free hot dogs after all this publicity you guys are doing. <laughs> that right there. That, com- <laughs> that is a comedically perfect description. <laughs> See you later, Ron. Love you guys. See you, Ron. I would like to celebrate when we talk here about artifacts and we talk about things in sports that are going to be of a time that I'm not totally sure are going to pass on to another age or generation of people who are going to have respect for artifacts from the past. John Sterling. Yankee broadcasting legend, has been broadcasting for 60 years and yesterday retired abruptly, effective immediately, and people worried for his health, and John Sterling was like, no, just tired. Just the baseball (laughs) season is insane. I saw that we had a Toronto game on the schedule. I'm older, and there are some old-timey baseball guys. Felo Ramirez down here was into his 90s traveling with the baseball team. The baseball schedule is an insanity. And John Sterling is a bona fide legend when you broadcast that long, Stugatz. But it's not in the perfectly pristine broadcasting case where Vin Scully exists no. from a bygone age, Ernie Harwell, old time broadcaster who raises your granddad, your dad, and you on baseball on the radio when America, when people wore, you know, top hats to the game in suits <laughs> because baseball is our most historic sport. Vin Scully dies and he takes that with him. John Sterling retires at the beginning of a Yankee season when they're in first place. He's seen a lot of bad baseball, Stu Gatz. He's called over 5,000 Yankee games. And he has done (laughs) some funny things that are mistakes that would happen to anybody who's broadcasting for three and a half hours a game, every game, and is on (laughs) game 120 and is 77 years old, and the Yankees are in fourth place. And this is Dante Bichette's kid that's playing for the Blue Jays, and you're... You're, you're mixing up his name, and because you're old, let's celebrate John Sterling correctly as somebody who uh, was a legend, is a legend, and was humanly a broadcasting voice for a time, a place, and a team. And the pitch hit in the air to deep left. It is high. It is far. It is gone. It's a grand slam. Non dimentica. That ball sure traveled far. Giancarlo. Gio Ashella, the most happy fella. Oh, he's the most happy fella. Over the high wall and into the monster seats. Romy, my homie. There's a drive deep left center field. It is high. Not as far. It is gone. It's Glaber Day. Glaber Torres powered one into the last row of the monster seats in left center. And like a good Glaber, Torres is there. Here is Judge. Here's the 2 2. Swung on and hit in the air to deep left. That ball is gone. A Judgian blast. All rise. Here comes the judge. Here's the two on to Gardner. 
Swung on, hit in the air to deep right. That ball is high. It is far. It is gone. <laughs> oh, let the guardy party begin. And they're on their feet. The pitch swung on, hit high in the air, deep down the left field line. It is going to be gone. He's done it. A long, high drive down the left field line. Just fair for a three-run home run. Alex Rodriguez has made Major League Baseball history the youngest player ever to hit 500 home runs. An A-bomb from A-Rod. Not as many mistakes in there as I would have liked to have heard. Because... <laughs> I wanted to build him up before because I know what you wanted to do here. He's so good, though. He was different. He was ahead of his time in terms of being different. He called every single one of Derek Jeter's at-bats. <laughs> All right, but wow. wait a minute. He, he would also sort of, on home run calls, throw his arms over his head and shake them back and forth so his home run calls would be more jowly. And he also made some excellent mistakes. Where are the mistakes? Because that's very nice of you, very respectful of you to just give – uh, John Sterling, a bow, a genuflect here on behalf of his broadcasting career by playing the good ones. What about the good ones? Now here is Judge. Man, the breaking ball is hit in the air to yep. deep left. That ball is high. It is far. It is gone. Unfortunately, that was a replay of the home run, but it was a good replay. <laughs> Please tell me you have more of those because there are many. Here's the 1 0. Swung on, there it goes. Deep left center. That ball is high. It is far. It is gone. But caught. What? At the wall, caught by Tapia. Oh. Boy, I thought that was gone. Apparently. Oh. Uh, wow. Give me one more. Oh, Tanaka. The sun will shine. Anyway, Tanaka. It's <laughs> just a complete game shutout. What the hell was that? <laughs> All right, now we have one more mistake one. Hit it. Swung on. There it goes. Deep left. It is high. It is far. It is gone. Number 62 to set the new American League record. Aaron Judge hits his 62nd. All the Yankees out of the dugout to greet him. Just think of it. Three Yankee right fielders. The Babe hitting 60 and 27. The Jolly Roger hitting 61 and 61. And now Aaron Judge hits his 62nd home run. The most home runs any American leaguer has hit in a single season. And the American League has been alive for 120 years. This is Judgment Day. Case closed. <laughs> now, we did all that. Can we just play him getting hit with a foul ball? Because I feel like that's what all this was for. It's my favorite clip in probably the history of baseball. Now, the 3-2 th swung on. A pop foul back here. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> It really hit me. I didn't know it was coming back that far. So once again, it'll be a 3-2. And Holmes ready to deal. A ground ball at the third. Donaldson squares, throws to first, in time. Ball game over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. Is the you know, that foul ball actually hit me. It kind of glanced off my forehead. <laughs> so I took one for the team. Okay, John. <laughs> he stayed in the booth. I mean, he finished it out. Yes, he right. did. Uh, right. Chris Cody, can you, I heard Susie Waldman at the end of that. Can you just find us the legendary sound of her getting so excited when Roger Clemens returned and was in a suite so that I can remember a different time in my life and in Yankee baseball History. John Sterling called 30% of all Yankee games ever played. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of games. Do you yeah. think the TikTok generation is going to have any understanding of a radio broadcaster mattering to a region on behalf of a team? Like that, this ends with this crop of broadcasters, right? Where somebody is hmm. handed down, that the sport is handed down to you as a child from a parent or grandparent who was also listening to this person locally in the car as you grew up. 
that dies with this crop of broadcasters, right? Uh, yeah. Are you including like Eric Reed with this crop of broadcasters? Boog. I'm talking uh, about a radio baseball broadcaster, somebody who exists. Okay. Most people listening to this have no idea what John Sterling looks like. He is not a televised product. He is somebody who has existed in the traveling circus of the baseball economy, going from place to place to broadcast on radio something to people back home who cannot see it. That voice gets ingrained in a region, a people, gets passed down to families. And what I'm asking you is, does it die now? Because it's a very specific thing. It's not, look, man, Vern Lundquist got a real nice send-off at the Masters. Most broadcasters aren't going to get that. Hey, we really appreciated you. You were good at, at, about a time, about a craft, and the, what you mean to me is something you mean to me and my family. I can say Vern Lundquist, I can say John Sterling, and it means something. I do have a few local broadcasters. When you mention Eric Reed, he has been doing, he televised broadcasts since the very beginning. Yes. He will be such a broadcaster uh, locally. But there is, I don't think, anything like the regional baseball announcer who does it from your grandparents' age, who grandfathers in uh, Joe Buck as a broadcaster. You still have Bob Euchre doing it. I mean, you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah. But and on but the he's of that generation. Radio, television. Yeah. Yes, Bob Euchre. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't mean to say that John Sterling is the last of them. I'm just saying that these guys, yes. that there will never be anything like this again. What I'm talking about, the specific sports connection that's going to get lost because who the hell is going to listen to tinny games on the radio? Well, the young people will get old, and then they'll be the old people. And, and there's we'll always going to be old people. to pass down. Yeah, we'll pass down TikTokers. The people who are recapping the game in 60 seconds. Are you passing down Kyle Seeloff to your kids? I'd love to do that. Yeah. We'll see Loff. Hmm. Oh, boy. I mean, you didn't no, have to do that. No, you didn't have here. to do God, that. Why, why? Why does he choose to be bad joke guy? <laughs> like, who makes that as a career Everyone choice? Everyone has a thing. No, but what? It's not fun. He's aggressively not funny. <laughs> Work for me. Aggressively not funny. The living artifact. That's right. Art, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> You're right, he's not funny, Dip. <laughs> Aggressively not funny. Why are we rewarding that? Well, he's not a quitter. We're he's not. gonna keep yeah, he's gonna keep trying. You just put him in the box. He's but why, him. why does he think that's a wise career choice? Let me make this show not funny aggressively. It helps the rest of us. We'll by see off, <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. What? Aggressively not funny with his face on it. Oh, man, Kyle Seeloff shirt. Now, oh, that Seeloff. Get a Seeloff shirt. particular audience yeah. for that one, I would say. Yeah, that's true. Team store. Greg Cody? Yes. I want to get that T-shirt in my uh, merch store before uh, Kyle the Seeloff show one? does. Aggressively not funny. But no. it'll be my face on it. We'll see, Loff. Make a note to myself. Art of fact. You should have an art of fact shirt where you're dressed like an archaeologist. That's not bad. Like what Indiana do, Jones? What do yes. archaeologists dress like? You know, like Indiana, Indiana Jones, Jones like yeah. a, I, I, a Panama hat of sorts. I don't I think feel a like they actually dress lots of like pockets. That. Oh, they do. really? The good ones. Oh, do. he's the only one. The I good mean, ones do. He's the greatest of all no, time. All the okay. photos in the museums of the archaeologists have them dressed like that. If you don't dress like that, you're you're right. a fraud as an archaeologist put, put, and a failure. Put it That's on the correct. poll, Juju at Levitard show. Do archaeologists all dress like Indiana Jones? The good ones with a whip. Lucy Rodine, Iowa correspondent. She was there last night. Juju was there, but we couldn't get him. Uh, Juju's flying back, but they were at the WNBA draft. Uh, Stugatz and Greg Cody are talking during the break, and they're saying, we're like everyone. We tuned in for the first five minutes, and then we checked out. The ratings are going to be a monster in the first five minutes, and then they're going to decline because they always find the negative. The two what? of them. That's right. Lucy Rodine was there, though, Stugatz. In fairness, she didn't tune in to the NBA draft. They did. No, I actually did. I pulled up YouTube TV on my phone because I couldn't see what the like images they were showing. So I helped the viewership numbers. You're welcome. Billy says it was weird. Billy says the broadcast was Look, weird. Uh, that's a misrepresentation of what I said. 
<laughs> I did say it was weird, but I said that I thought that it was weird that the television broadcast was broadcast throughout the entire venue and that there was no clock alerting me when the next pick was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it all felt more of like a show than a draft because conveniently every time they finished their analysis, the next pick was in. So it didn't feel like an NFL draft per se. I said it felt more like a show. Defend me, Lucy, please. They say I hate women. Well, I think that's because they didn't take 45 <laughs> minutes with their picks, and that's exactly. why it didn't feel like the NFL draft to you. Hmm. But I like that pomp and circumstance. I like thinking there's things going on behind the scenes that aren't actually going on. It's just a bunch of old men at NFL you know, facilities not wanting to go home, having free food, eating that, and just wasting every precious second that they have. I like to think that there's actually action behind the scenes, you know? There was a lot of action behind the scenes. There were things going on, people moving about, fans there. <laughs> I liked like I, I liked that it was like pretty fast paced because there's nothing that bothers me more than watching a draft and like the first overall pick. You don't need to take any time with that. You should have it figured out. Yeah. It should be decided. Mm -hmm. uh, I was watching last night, Lucy, and I thought Marquisha Davis at 11 for the Liberty was a reach. What says you? I think that was one of the picks that was the most interesting and honestly the one that kind of made me the saddest in the sense because the draft was in Brooklyn, all the, the Liberty fans were chanting, we want Nika, we want Nika, and then did not draft her. So it was just kind of an odd moment. I didn't expect her to go that high, but, you know, I feel like there were a lot of picks. Like, I didn't expect Kate Martin to go as high as she did. I thought that Camille Cardoso would go a little bit lower, but I felt like everything seemed pretty, like, similar to what we've seen in mock drafts. Very nice. Uh, That's good. Lucy, Thank you. Uh, well, yes. the, re the only reason I'm You're applauding, applauding uh, I'm applauding you, yes, I'm <laughs> applauding that you baited Lucy into serious draft analysis right. by, and I did it. by saying something that um, I'm assuming you just ripped off from the internet. What? <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming you don't have any. You watched the entire yeah. first round. I'm telling you, Lila Lacan, the point guard from France, she's fantastic. She might turn out to be better than Caitlin Clark. How about that? Uh, Lucy, what were the highlights from last night, and what will Juju and you be returning with? Um, the highlights? I think, one, the fashion was really, really cool, and that's always my favorite part of events like this. Um, everyone looked so good. Angel Reese literally looked like a goddess. It was I just love seeing all these athletes dressed up with all their makeup on, their hair done. It was cool to see a sold out crowd and fans like the setup was kind of odd, but to have fans outside waiting for the buses to to come and like have the players come out, it was really cool. Um, it's the first time the WBA draft has had like an event of this size and it kind of showed just because the logistics were a little crazy, but to just see all these people so passionate, so many people were outside of the venue that did not have tickets that just wanted to be there to see these women, and that was very cool. Also, when Caitlin and Kate got drafted, that was so cool. Lucy, did you feel like you were a part of a cultural moment and movement? Like, are you feeling like the sport is shifting the constructs of what people are going to watch? Absolutely. And the one moment that like stuck out to me is we were doing fan interviews and this woman had an Iowa hat on and I was like, oh my God, did you go to Iowa? You're from Iowa? And she was like, no, I went to Texas. I'm just an Iowa bandwagon fan. <laughs> the moment there is an Iowa bandwagon fan, we know something has changed. The th <laughs> everything in the world is different. That's never been done before. Lucy, you mentioned fashion and uh, and, and your favorite player uh, wore a an outfit that costs uh, as much as a brand new car. Uh, I'd like you to critique Caitlin Clark in Prada. Um, Caitlin Clark wearing Prada. That was the first time Prada had ever dressed anyone for a draft. NBA, WNBA. I thought she looked phenomenal. I thought, hey, she's got money now. Spend it. She probably didn't spend anything. Prada wanted to dress her. She looked beautiful. All the women looked so good. She looked very cool. I love the glasses. What do you make of some of the numbers around the salaries, Lucy, and just the history? We were talking a little bit about uh, earlier in the show about uh, what a struggle it has been for the WNBA to get to this point uh, through Brittany Griner having to go through Russian hell because the salaries aren't right in this sport. Can you take me through the economics of how it is Caitlin Clark could make $76,000 in her rookie deal the first year, and people would look at that and point out that she would qualify for low-income housing in San Francisco based just on salary? 
It, that When you see the tweet and you see the numbers mapped out, it's so disheartening to see. But this is not anything that's new. I think that now more people are paying attention to the W. They're realizing, wow, like they're not making money here. I think the thing that's important to note, especially with this draft class coming in, this is the most talked about draft ca- class pretty much ever, especially in name recognition. So the NIL endorsements that these athletes had are not going to leave now that they are not in college. So Caitlin, Angel, Camilla, they'll still make money in the WNBA outside of their actual salary. But I think something that's important to notice is now people, they're seeing how low the salaries are. They're watching the draft. They're watching these games. You had at 1.24 million people watching the national championship game. The way salaries rise, the way that that things improve for the WNBA, you can charter flights and you have more resources, is by negotiating a higher TV deal, and that is what's in the future for them. Well, that's where we are right now, though. This is the part that I want uh, out in front of the lights, Stugatz, because when you talk about everyone in sports just sort of being at this oil well, being, wait a minute, holy shit, at the exact perfect time of the streaming wars, need these live sports content you have birthed in front of us yesterday they've got a made for television event all of a sudden that people care about because it's a night it's a party it's fashion it's a it's the league celebrating itself were you emotional at any point in the middle of this lucy because i i i don't know if that can happen to you at a gala as well they can um you're gonna be so disappointed i didn't cry i did not what? cry i told i know I don't know what it was. Um, I did not cry. I, if Caitlin had cried, I would have cried. But she did not cry, so I <laughs> held it together. There was always the mo- there was like there was emotions in the sense of like every once in a while when we go, especially to these women's sporting events. Like I will just sit there, and it it always hit me for a second that like all of these people are here supporting women, which is not something unfortunately that we see very often. To and like especially like. I love seeing women support women, and that's what we should do, and that's awesome. But when you see a man, like, wearing a Liberty jersey, like, that just makes you feel so good to see so much outward support for women. So I did not cry. I did feel all of the emotions. And honestly, me not crying, I'm shocked. I don't know. I should probably go to a doctor or something. Well, what do you make of the conversation, though, around Caitlin Clark, where it appears that when you talk about women supporting women, you get some critiques of her that people are viewing as overly harsh on her prospects. So explain to me or walk me through the the conversation happening around Caitlin Clark, where even though she's been graceful at every turn, people will point out, hey, the sport was something that had really special players before you got here. It's one of the sport had very, very special players before Caitlin got here. I think that the whole like, Wow, these WNBA alum are, you know, like just talking crap about Caitlyn. I don't think that's an accurate statement. Uh, Diana Diana Taurasi talks crap about everybody. This is not new information. This is who she is, and it's why we love her. So her being like, yeah, Caitlyn's going to struggle, which like I'm not going to say Caitlyn's going to struggle. There will be an adjustment period. There will be a learning curve. She's playing at a different level, the highest level, like She's not going to most, I hope she does, but I doubt that she's going to drop 40 a game like she was doing late in the tournament for Iowa when she gets to the W. There's going to be an adjustment curve, and that's what people have been pointing out. There have been a few instances where I'm like, you know what, maybe you shouldn't have said that. I didn't really like it. But when it comes to, like, Diana Taurasi, please, that's what she does all the time. Sue Bird, they were calling the Iowa UConn game their UConn alum. Like, that's, you don't come to me for unbiased Iowa opinions. Like, oh, people were just being ridiculous. Lucy, I'm jumping in. I'm becoming a fan of the WNBA this season. I need a team, okay? The Fever. What do you mean? I know, but I feel like that's be. the easy one. I feel like that one. I feel well, like that's I'll get the cr- one I want you to pick. Okay, you that's asked who me. I'm picking. Here's your answer. All right. I mean, I'll consider them. I was thinking Chicago Sky. I mean, they had the two top early picks last night. I, I, the roster must not be that great if they got those two picks. But I don't know. Just if, if it wasn't Indiana, give me a couple other teams for people that are looking for teams that might be fun ones to follow. I would go, well, if you just want to win, why don't go Aces? They're the most dominant team Can't do that by either. a mile. Um, you don't want to do that? I, I I feel like people criticize if you go in, like I did this with Premier League a few years ago with soccer. Like you can't take the Chelsea's or the Man United's. You got to take a team in that like, mi- like I just, an underdog. Yeah. Yeah. Everton. Everton. A, story, yeah. a story to believe in, not a front runner. 
Cameron Brink was one of my favorite players in the draft. So rooting for the Sparks would be very fun. That's a program that has a lot of history. It's kind of been a, a rough couple years. That would be a team that could be fun to root for. But I don't know if you want to go L.A. or mainstream. Um, what about the Liberty's Sky? Liberty's crazy fun, but that's also bandwagon. Yeah, go to Sky. Sounds Angel like Reese is decided. amazing to root for. Yeah, I'm trying to help him. And then you asked me a question, and you already knew the answer. He seems like he just wants to follow this guy here, Lucy. I don't know why he's asking that's you for just, your advice. That is where I'm and leaning. I love that for you. Do it. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, I love Angel Reese. I love Camilla Cardoso. That was such a good draft. I'm happy for them. Great draft. Do, do they have anyone else, though? Do they, well, that's they're drafting kind of a lot early. It's actually so. just two people on that team. Yeah, that's it. That's the entire roster. It's just Camilla and Angel versus the world. A lot of pressure, though, on Indiana Fever head coach Christy Sides, right? Because they have Caitlin Clark. They also got Mackenzie Forbes, uh, and they stole Mackenzie Forbes in the third round. Ton of pressure. She has to win now, right? Yeah, Stu, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. I, God, you were such a WNBA expert. I don't that's know what we were doing without you here. He is the expert here. that yep. he is. I need, I need to explain to, he loves e- it. to everyone here that Lucy Rodine is climbing up the charts here in the media. She has gotten very popular. Now she's got a new collaborative project between Metal Arc Media and the DraftKings Network. It's a standalone program. It's going to make its on-air debut June 7th, 8 p.m. Eastern on the DraftKings Network. And... It is hashtag good follow show on socials, IG, X, and TikTok. Hashtag good follow show. Uh, Lucy, tell me about this project that you're collaborating on. So DraftKings and Medlark has hired a bunch of amazing women to come together and create a women's sports show by women for women. But it's not the typical women's sports show in the sense like It's cool, it's culture, it's fashion, it's sports, it's all the things that we love about sports and women's sports combined into um, a show on the DraftKings Network. But follow us on social now. We're on Instagram. That's where I posted the Fit Check yesterday. They're doing great work. They're highlighting sports and coverage that needs to be covered. So please follow or you're dead to me. The coverage that needs to be covered. How's that for good follow show? It's mm-hmm. the coverage that needs to be covered. Yes. Lucy Rodine is climbing up. That's with, why they call it a good follow, with Dan. thoughts Governor. like that. If you want to be covered, she'll cover you. She's covered in coverage. Lucy Rodine, Iowa correspondent. This is the Dan Lebator Show with the Stugats Podcast.